Guys, I want to say this, that today in our society, and this mentality has even now crept into the church, we assume that if something is good, <clears throat> we automatically identify it as being of God. In other words, we've almost made good and God synonymous. Because after all, aren't we born with the inherent knowledge of what is right and wrong? But now let me say this. If good is so obvious, why then does God tell us in the book of Hebrews that you have to have discernment to recognize the difference between good and evil? Why does King Solomon at the dawn of his reign, the beginning of his reign, cry out, God give your servant an understanding heart that I might be able to discern between good and evil. Now, I want to set up the context here. He's about to take the throne of Israel. God appears to him, which that is amazing. And God says, ask me anything that you want. And he asked for the ability to tell the difference between good and evil. I don't think good is as obvious as we think it is. I mean, you would think it is a good idea to preserve the life of your friend. Yet Peter does this with Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and sharply corrects him and says, Peter, you are seeing things from a human point of view, not from God's point of view. If you remember, the rich young ruler comes running up to Jesus and he cries out, good teacher, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And before Jesus answers the all important question of how to be saved, Jesus said, why do you call me good? Nobody's good but God. Now, is Jesus not good? No, he is perfect good. But you know what Jesus is saying to this guy? You have a reference point for good. God has a reference point for good. The two are not one and the same. Don't put me in your category. See, good is all about a reference point. You can have two families moving into identical homes, three bedroom, two bath homes. For one family, it's a good move. For one family, it's a bad move. The family, it's a good move. They just moved out of a trailer. The family, it's a bad move. They just moved out of a $3 million estate. I remember when God really made this clear to me. I had flown to Sweden, Stockholm, Sweden, and I was getting ready to speak to 6,000 leaders from over 60 nations, mostly Eastern Europe and the Middle East. And I remember I landed early in the morning in Stockholm and I had all day to pray in my hotel room because you really, you know, you don't speak English or Swedish and so you don't have a lot to do. So I'm praying in my hotel room and I had judged a certain situation to be good. And I remember in that hotel room, the Holy Spirit very sternly said to me, no, son, it's not good. And he gave me scripture to support what he was saying. And I found myself getting in a re little wrestling match with the Holy Spirit. And finally, I just kind of put my foot down and I said, but God, all the good that's come out of this situation. And then the Lord said this to me, and this is what impacted me forever. He said, son, it wasn't the evil side of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that Eve was attracted to. It was the good side. And I remember when he said that, my Bible's laying there on the bed in the hotel room and I flew over to Genesis and when I saw the words, when the woman saw the tree was good and the word good literally leapt up off the page at me. She saw it was pleasant, she saw it was desirable, she partook. And I'm standing there in shock in this hotel room and all of a sudden God says to me, he said, son, there is a good that will lead people away from me. And all of a sudden now, I realize in that hotel room how Jesus' words would be fulfilled. You know, when anybody asked Jesus what it was going to be like in the last days, the days right before he returns back, do you know what the first thing he says is? Be careful that you're not deceived. Now, there is only one problem with deception, and that is this. It's deceiving the person who's deceived believes with all their heart they're right, when in reality, they're wrong. That's scary. And then Jesus goes on to say the deception is going to be so potent that if possible, the elect are going to be deceived. Now, that used to bother me. I thought the elect are Christians. How are Christians going to be deceived? And in that hotel room, all of a sudden I realized it's not drug-infested parties. It's not satanic rock concerts. It's not sexual orgies. They're going to deceive, if possible, the elect. It's going to be evil that is masked with good. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way, there is a method, there is wisdom that seems right. It seems beneficial. It seems profitable. It seems acceptable. It seems good to a man. 
But it's in where it takes you is where you don't want to find yourself. This is why the apostle James comes along in the New Testament. And James makes this statement. He says, do not be deceived. Now, that looks like a command, but it's not. It's actually a promise. Do you know what James is saying here? He's saying if you get this truth firmly, firmly established in your heart, you'll never be deceived. Now, I don't know about you guys, but in a day when Jesus tells me that the deception is going to be so powerful that if possible, the elect are going to be deceived, I want to know how to be deceived-proofed. Anybody in here joining me on that one? Can I see a show of hands? So what's this truth, James? He goes on to say, every good and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, of whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. Now, I'm going to simplify what he just said to you. What James is saying is he's saying, if you get this truth in you, you'll never, ever be deceived. What's the truth, James? Here it is. Are you ready, guys? There is nothing good for you outside of God. That's it. I don't care how good it looks, how profitable it appears. How beneficial it seems to your future. How acceptable it is to our society. How sweet she talks to you. And how rude your wife has been talking to you. If it is contrary to the written word of God, it will ultimately bring you to a place you don't want to find yourself. So the question that we got to establish right in the beginning here tonight is what is the standard? What's our reference point? Remember I said good is all about a reference point, guys. What's our reference point in this confused day that we're living in? Where you've got an Olympic champion absolutely doing something that's literally caused our whole society to go further and further away from what God established this truth. What is our reference point? Paul tells us right before he leaves the earth. Paul says this. He says in 2 Timothy, all scripture, everybody say all scripture, all scripture, is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true, what is good, and to make us realize what is wrong, what's bad in our lives. Now look at this, it corrects us when we're wrong, when we're bad. Somebody says here, I don't like correction. Oh, you don't? Well, then watch this. He's heading for San Diego. Can you start again? Can you start that again? I think you guys missed the beginning. Finding directions to San Diego, California. Head west, then turn left on Highway 105. Rerouting. Make a U-turn and proceed to Red Rock Ranch Drive. Red. Make a U-turn. I'm pretty sure I've been here before. I think I know what I'm doing. Make a U-turn and proceed to Red Rock Ranch Drive. Make a U-turn. Rerouting. U-turn. Make a U-turn. Make a U-turn. Okay, obviously, you don't know where you're going, all right? Make a U-turn and proceed to Redskins. Siri, if you don't know where you've been, how do you know where you're going? You don't make a U-turn. You know what? Do a U-turn. He's heading to San Diego. He ends up in Saska Saska Saskatchewan. What happened? He wasn't listening to correction. I don't know why correction is so negative to people. If you're on the wrong road, it keeps you on the right road. If you're on the right road, it keeps you on the right road. So you don't end up at a destination you don't want to find yourself. He ended up at a destination he didn't want to end up at. And so what is our reference point? It's the scripture. Can I talk about the scripture just for a couple of minutes? 66 books written over the course of 1,500 years. Would you go back 1,500 years? You're at 516 AD. Do you understand the British Empire hasn't even been established yet? Do you understand it's only 200 years after Constantine of the Roman Empire? 1,500 years is a long time. 66 books written over 1,500 years by over 40 writers from three different continents in three different languages. Many of these writers don't even live in the same generation. Many of them don't even know what the other guys wrote, yet you put the whole thing together and you get this perfectly harmonized book called the Bible. 
come on, what are the chances of that? That's like going back to 516, pick out a guy, say, write a chapter. Then go to 616, 100 years later, pick out another guy, say, write a chapter. Then go to, you know, to another continent in 716, pick out another guy, say, write a chapter. You do this with over 40 writers over and right up till 2016, and you tell me you've got a book that makes any sense? But to, but to even sweeten the deal more, if you look at the Old Testament, 39 books written over the course of 1,100 years, with the last book of the Old Testament written 400 years before Jesus was even born, many of these writers didn't even live in the same generation, don't even know what the other guys wrote, yet they made predictions about the coming Messiah, things like he'd be born in Bethlehem, he'd be called out of Egypt, he would be betrayed by a friend, ride in Jerusalem on a donkey, he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, that 30 pieces of silver would be put in a potter's field. All this is written by guys hundreds of years before Jesus is born. In fact, they wrote 300 of these predictions. Last one's written 400 years before Jesus is even born, and Jesus comes along and fulfills them all. What are the chances? You know, a scientist in the 20th century said, what is the probability that anybody on earth over 2,000 years could just fulfill eight of the prophecies? And, at, and he employed 600 other scientists. And after hours of research, they determined the chances that any human being on earth could fulfill just eight of the 300 was one in 10 to the 17th power. That is a one with 17 zeros behind it. If I had that many silver dollars, I would cover the entire state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars. If you mark one of those silver dollars, blindfold a guy in Oklahoma and fly him over Texas, he gets down, blindfolded, picks up one silver dollar. The chance of picking up that one silver dollar is the chances that any human being on earth could have fulfilled just eight of those prophecies, yet Jesus not only fulfilled the eight, he fulfilled all 300. You know that scientist said, what about 48 prophecies? And after hours of research, and by the way, the American National Scientific Council said that not only was his work accurate, he and his 600 scientists, but it was conservative. This is conservative. They said, what are the chances that anybody can fulfill 48 of the prophecies? After hours of calculations, they determined the chances were 1 in 10 to the 157th power. That is a 1 with 157 zeros behind it. If I, have, if I have a number like that, the only way I can illustrate it is to go down to an electron. Do you know how big an electron is? If I have a 1 inch line of electrons, and I start counting them tonight, and I count 250 per minute, and I don't go to sleep, it would take me 19 million years to count that one inch line of electrons. If I have 10 to the 157th electrons, I'd have to make a big ball of electrons, solid electrons. Do you know how big that sphere would be? As far as man has ever seen into space with the Hubble State Space Telescope, 13 billion light years. Now blindfold a guy, put him in a space shuttle, send him in outer space. At any point in time, he can say stop. Then he gets out, still blindfolded. He picks one electron. The chance of picking our one marked electron is the chance that any human being over 2,000 years could have fulfilled 48 of those prophecies. Yet Jesus not only fulfilled 48, he fulfilled all 300. Now, can, I re can we just review what I just said? You got 39 books written by several different writers. Many of them don't even live in the same generation. They make 300 predictions about the Messiah. The last one's written 400 years before he's born. And then Jesus comes along and fulfills them all. And you tell me the Bible doesn't apply to today. You're stupid. <laughs> hey, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't say that first. Look what Proverbs says. He who hates correction is stupid. This is why the writer of Hebrews comes and tells us. Look what the writer of Hebrews says. He's writing to Christians here. We must, not we should, we must listen very carefully. Notice the words very carefully. To the truth we've heard or we may drift away from it. How many of you know drifting doesn't happen consciously? It happens unconsciously. When I was a boy, I used to love to fish in White Lake, Michigan. One time I was so excited about fishing, I forgot to anchor. I'm fishing away 30 minutes. I look up, I don't even recognize the shoreline. I have drifted so far from where I've started. Drifting doesn't happen consciously. Can I ask you a question? If you, if you had to cross a landmine field 10 miles long, 10 miles wide, and there were thousands of landmines buried underneath the ground, you step on one of them, you're dead. Somebody gives you a map, tells you where all those landmines are. How do you handle that map? 
Do you just throw it in your backpack and say, I'll read it if I got time? Do you kind of just look at it and say, oh, I got it, put it in your backpack and take off? Do either of those, they're carrying you out in a body bag. I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. You're going to study it like crazy. Then you're going to put it in a place easier to reach in your water bottle. You're going to pull it out constantly. Let me tell you something. We're walking across a landmine field, guys. It's called the world. And that's why we're told, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light unto my path. You know, when I wrote this book, this is the 19th book I've written. The books now are pushing 10 million in copies all over the world. They're in 73 languages. But I had three international leaders. If I named them, many of you would know these leaders. And they all three, in three different states, three different months, said to me, John Bevere, this is one of the most important books you've written for the body of Christ to this date. And I thought, what? I remember after the third one said it to me. I went to the Lord and I said, why is this one so important? And this is what the Lord said to me. He said, it's a calibration book. And so I thought, a calibration. You calibrate a machine to get accurate readings. So I, I thought, let me go into this further. I found out that calibration, the most frequent usage of this word, is used in regard to gas detectors in chemical factories. Federal law requires that every single room in a chemical factory has a gas detector because why a little bit of toxins in the air can damage the employees for life, even kill them. And I know this from firsthand because my dad worked for DuPont and, there, and safety was crazy important. And so you, I found out Honeywell was the number one manufacturer of these gas detectors and I went to their website and I said, I asked on their, on their search page, I said, how do, you, how do you calibrate one of your gas detectors? And it brought me to this page and in bold letters above the page, it said, we strongly recommend that you calibrate these machines daily. And then they gave the reason. They said, because the atmosphere in the chemical factory can corrupt the sensors. So now I'm reading what this technician's reading on this page. And this gets a little technical, so I'm going to simplify it. Basically, they take the, the gas detectors, they bring them into a clean air room, and they clean off the sensors. Okay, because the atmosphere corrupts the sensors. They re-zero out the machine. They put it out so they know that they're getting accurate readings that day. Well, let me tell you something. Your heart's your sensor, guy. We live in a corrupt environment. It's called the world. Every day, we should be going to a clean air environment. That's why small groups are so important. And what do we do? We get washed with the water of the word so that when we go out and back out into the world, we're not conformed to it. But we prove what is good. You see, it's not a formula. And perfect an acceptable will of God. Why is this so important? Why am I bringing this up tonight? Because today in the United States of America, I have never seen the word of God under such attack, scriptures under such attack. And I'm not just talking about in our society. It's even creeping into our churches. There are literally scriptures and even chapters being cut out and not spoken about in churches because they're not happy verses. And the thing is, the Apostle Paul made this statement. He said, I'm innocent of the blood of all men because I did not shun to declare to you the whole counsel of God, not just the happy parts, not just the encouraging parts, also the corrective parts that keep us from ending up in a destination we don't want to end up in. Let me show you one verse of Scripture that you just don't hear much anymore today in the American church. Probably hear it in this church because I know your pastor real well. But I'm going to show it to you. And that's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. I want you to look at this scripture. It says pursue. Now, that word pursue, I'm going to give you the definition, guys. It means chase after with the intent to apprehend. So I want to read that scripture again. Go back to that scripture. Pursue, chase after with the intent to apprehend what? I want everybody to say it really loud. Did you cringe when you said it? Most of us do. And there's a reason for it. You know, I'm just not hearing us talk about holiness today in the American church. Why? Why aren't we talking about it? Because it is a major subject in the New Testament. It's a major thing that God talks about. 
I'm going to tell you, I want to, I want to, I want to open it up tonight. I, I want to share with you why we don't like talking about holiness. So in order to do so, I want you to put yourself in the devil's shoes for 30 seconds, guys, okay? How many of you know the devil can read? He can read Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic as well. How many of you know he's read the New Testament more times than you have? Okay? He's read the entire, whole, the entire New Testament. And you know what he's noticed? Is that there's only one description of the church that Jesus is coming back for. It's not a relevant church. Is relevance important? Oh yeah, you better believe it. We won't reach people if we're not relevant. It's not a leadership driven church. Is leadership important? Oh yeah, we'll never get anything accomplished if we don't have leadership. It's not a connected church. Is connected, being connected important? You, yeah, you better believe it. I mean, small groups being connected, it's not good that man's alone, God said, right? But that's not the description of the church that Jesus come back for. You know what the, the only description of the church that Jesus come back for? The only one. It's a holy church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Now, do you know what the predominant description of God is in the whole Bible? Isaiah goes to the throne. John goes to the throne. Isaiah 6, Revelation 5, same throne. The two men see the throne of God. There are these massive beings called seraphim. And they are crying one to another, holy. And they're crying it out so loud. You know, we wrote a song and people yawn. They're not singing a song. They're crying out one to another. Every moment, another facet of his glory is being revealed. And all they can do is cry holy. And you know what? The Bible says the doorpost of a building that seats about a billion beings gets shaken from them crying it out. They're not crying love, love, love. Is God love? Oh yeah, he doesn't even have love. He is love. But they're not crying love, love, love because that's not the predominant characteristic of him. They're not crying faithful, faithful, faithful. Is God faithful? You better believe it. But they're not crying out faithful, faithful, faithful. They're crying holy. So you're the devil and you've read this. The predominant description of God in the Bible is holy. The only description of the church that Jesus come back for is holy. So what do you do if you're the devil? You raise up a bunch of mean, spirited preachers and pastors. I mean, these guys don't even like people. I mean, you've got no business teaching the Bible if you don't like people. Go teach geography. But don't preach the Bible. So these guys don't even like people. So you know what they did? They beat us up with their legalistic view of holiness. And they made holiness an end to itself. They beat us up with their legalism. Pounded us out in the lifestyle they felt we should live. And they made holiness a complete end to itself. Holiness is not an end to itself. So you know what happened, guys? There's a Chinese proverb that got fulfilled. You know what the Chinese proverb is? The cat that has been scalded by the boiling water will fear now the cool. That's a Chinese proverb. What is that proverb saying? If you pour boiling water on a cat, now if you put cool water out, which will give that cat life, he'll run away from the cool water because he's been scalded by the boiling water. So now you mention holiness and people go, ah! I've been scalded by that junk. I don't want to hear about it. But then we had some clever teachers come along and they were like, we can't, we can't avoid this. It's like a major doctrine. This is a foundational doctrine. So these clever teachers came along. You know what they did? They said, okay, guys, don't worry about holiness. Jesus is your holiness. You don't have to worry about the way you live. Don't even think about the way you live. Don't, don't sweat it. Jesus is the one that made you holy. Don't ever, ever even have to think about it. So what did they do, these clever teachers? They lumped the two different aspects of holiness the New Testament talks about all together into one pot. There are two different aspects of holiness that the New Testament talks about. The first one is our positional holiness. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. It says this, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy. Everybody shout holy. holy. Shout it again. Holy. Shout it one more time. Holy. And without blame before him. Listen to me. God did that before the foundation of the world. When he declared that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, he said, when a person receives Jesus, what he did at Calvary will count for him, and that will make him holy and set apart for me. 
So the moment you got saved, God declared you holy. And you're never going to be more holy than you were the day you got saved. Let me give you an example. Lisa and I, we got married 34 years ago this October 2nd. The day we got married, she became my wife. She is not more my wife today, 34 years later, than she was the day I married her. And she's not going to be my wife more 34 years from today. Positionally, she is my wife. Always been that way. Excuse me. It's been that way since October 2nd, 1982, and it's going to be that way the rest of the eternity. Are you tracking with me? That's her position she holds with me. But now let me tell you about me before I got married. Before I got married, I flirted with girls. I got their phone numbers. <laughs> I dated girls. After I got married to Lisa, I stopped flirting with girls. I stopped getting their phone numbers. I started behaving with them in an appropriate way that matched the position that I held with her as her husband. That was my behavior. Now, I didn't say, I'm, I, I, I can't go within 25 yards of any woman. I'm around women constantly. I sit next to them on planes. There's more women on, than men on our ministry team. I'm around women all the time. But what happens? I have an appropriate behavior. What about us with Jesus? Look what Peter says. Live as children of obedience to God. Do not conform yourselves to the evil desires that governed you in your former ignorance when you did not know the, requ the requirements of the gospel. But as the one who called you is holy, you yourselves also be holy. Now look at this. Be holy in all your conduct and manner of living. Peter's not talking about positional holiness here. He's talking about behavioral holiness. Now, if you look at Hebrews chapter 14, verse 12, 14 again, pursue holiness. What does pursue mean? Chase after with the intent to apprehend. He cannot be talking about positional holiness here. He's got to be talking about behavioral holiness. Because look what he goes on to say, without which no one will see the Lord. Now, I'm going to address that in just a second. But before I can address that, i got to tell us how to live holy, okay? Now, look at the next statement. Looking carefully. Everybody say, looking carefully. Looking say it with conviction. Looking carefully. looking carefully. It means looking at yourself carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Whoa, 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 whoa. How could you ever fall short of the grace of God? We're preaching in America today. It'd be impossible. So maybe we don't understand the full meaning of grace. No, we don't. Let me share with you. In 2009, a nationwide survey was done all across America. Over 5,000 Christians were polled. In this survey, this is the question that was asked, guys. Give three or more definitions or descriptions of the grace of God. The overwhelming majority said these four answers. Salvation, a free unmerited gift, forgiveness of sins, and the love of God. I'm so glad American Christians understand that we're saved by grace, and only by grace you can't earn that grace because it's God's gift. And by the grace of God, our sins have been forgiven because it's his love. I'm so glad Americans understood that. But here's where the tragedy occurred in this survey. Are you ready, guys? Only 2%. Did you hear what I just said? 2% said that grace was God's empowerment. Yet this is exactly how God defines his grace. He says to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you for my power. Now, these words are read in your Bible, which means they are straight from the mouth of God. God refers to his grace as his what? Come on, everybody say it. His what? For my power, which is my grace, is made perfect in your human inability. Look what Peter says about grace. Peter says, grace be multiplied to you as his divine what? Come on, everybody say it with some conviction. As his divine power. So if Peter refers to grace as his divine power, has given to us everything that we need for living a godly life. If you look at the root word for grace, it's the Greek word charis. Strong's defines it as this. 
gift, favor, benefit, gracious, and liberality. If you take this initial definition, you couple it together with selected scriptures in the book of Ephesians, Romans, and Galatians, you get the grace of God that most American Christians are familiar with. However, Strong's doesn't stop. He goes on to define the Greek word for grace as the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. You can see there is an outward reflection of what's done in the heart. That's the empowerment of grace. When Barnabas went to the churches in Antioch in Acts chapter 11, he saw the grace of God on the people. He didn't hear about it. He saw the empowerment that was reflected in their life. I want you to look at me, every one of you. Don't look at the board, look at me. Or look at me on the board. I was bound to pornography. I got married in 1982 to Lisa Bevere. I thought, she's gorgeous, it'll be alleviated. I was still bound to pornography. I went into the ministry, I was still bound to pornography. You wanna know why? Because I was trying to get free in my own strength. But then I discovered the grace of God, that it's not just forgiveness of sins, it's not just a free gift, it's his empowerment that gives me the ability where I couldn't do in my own ability. And I got free May the 6th, 1985, and I've been free since. Now, if you look at Hebrews again, it makes sense. Look at this. Go to the next slide for me, guys. The PowerPoint crash. We lose it. Pursue holiness without which no man will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Now you understand what it means to fall short. If I give you a vehicle and say, here, it's yours, you can do whatever you want, and all you do is play the stereo and use the air conditioning and never drive it, you've fallen short of my gift that I've given to you. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Now look, I'm going to go a few verses later. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace. Everybody shout grace. grace. By which we may serve God acceptably. That's behavior. What is the acceptable way to serve God? Come on, guys. Pursue holiness. Now here's the tragedy. I want you to look up at me. I want you to look up at me. Listen, to, listen, listen, listen. Do you understand that 98% of the Christians in America are trying to live godly in their own ability? How do I know that? Because you can't have anything from God unless you believe. And you can't believe what you don't know. So if 98% of the Christians in America don't even know grace is God's empowerment, that means 98% of the Christians in America are trying to live godly in their own ability. You know what happens if you try to live godly in your own ability? One of two things. Either you become a hypocritical legalist or you become a loosey-goosey, make up all the strange doctrine like grace covers all the sin I love standing I'm a very thin, nice person. <laughs> but when you understand that grace is God's empowerment, you become a happy man because it's not your ability anymore. Do you see what we've done by underselling grace? We thought we were protecting people from bondage because we were all scalded by this legalism. When in reality, what we did is we kept people from walking in freedom because they were trying to do it in their own ability. And then finally, we said, don't worry about it. Jesus did it all. See, look at Romans chapter 5, verse 2. It says, we have access by faith. Only by believing do we get access to the grace in which we stand. See, some of you guys are going to find out tonight. Oh, my gosh, I've been trying to do this in my own ability. All you have to do is depend on grace. If you remember the apostles, Jesus told them to go to the other side. They were straining against rowing for nine hours. Jesus comes walking on the water, and the Bible said he would have passed them by, but they cried out. They were smart. He got into the boat. Grace got into the boat, and instantly they're the other side. You may be doing what Jesus is telling you to do, but you're struggling. You're straining at rowing, and now Jesus is going to walk by your boat daily, and you're going to cry out, and grace is going to get in your boat, and you're going to find out how free you really are some of you are going to get this. I, I know you are. I know you are. So let's look at Hebrews 12, 14, because this is the happy part. Pursue holiness. Now look at this. 
without which no one will see the Lord. Now, what is he talking about? Everybody's going to see God. I mean, the Bible says when he comes, every eye is going to behold him. The Bible says every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. What does he mean? Without holiness, no man's going to see the Lord. Let me explain it to you like this. As an American citizen for the last 56 years, I've been under 10 presidents. I've been under their rulership, their jurisdiction, their decisions have affected my life. But you know, I've never seen one of them. I've never been in the presence of a president of the United States. But now there's other Americans, they know the president. They're friends with him or they work with him. They see him every day. They're in his presence every day. Well, there's Christians. They're under Jesus' rulership. His decisions affect their life. They're under his jurisdiction. But they're not in his presence. They're not experiencing intimacy with him. I'm going to let Jesus really settle this one. Look what Jesus says. These, these words are read. John 14, guys. John 14. Uh, it should be the last PowerPoint. The last one. Yeah, there it is. Can you go back one? That's the end of it. Look what Jesus says. The person who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who really loves me. Now, how do we keep his commandments? He gave us the way. It's called what, guys? Come on, say it. There you go. The person who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who really loves me. And I too will love him. Now look at this. And I'll show. I'll reveal, manifest myself to him. I will let myself clearly be. What? Seen. Pursue holiness without which no one's going to see the Lord. I will let myself clearly be seen by him and make myself real to him. So there you have it, guys. Holiness isn't an end to itself. It's the doorway into intimacy with God in every true Christian. That is their greatest cry is to be intimate with God. Do you know what we've done, unfortunately, by trying to alleviate men from pursuing holiness? I'm going sh to show you what it's like. It's like me walking up to my wife, Lisa, and saying, holding up my marriage contract, saying, hey, I'm married to you. See, we are legally married while I'm jumping in bed with other women. Now, I may technically, still technically be married to her. And that probably won't last long. <laughs> but I guarantee you, she's not going to share with me the secrets, the desires, the intentions of her heart. I have cut myself off from intimacy with her. I may love her and love her more than my other girls I'm jumping in bed with. But I guarantee you she's not going to be intimate with me because I'm an adulterer. And you know what James says? You're seeking a friendship with the world? He's writing to Christians. You're an adulterer. Yeah, you may technically still be married. But you're not going to have intimacy. Do you want to know why I don't commit adultery against my wife, Lisa? Can I tell you why? There's three reasons. Number one, I fear God. Okay. Number two, she'll kill me. <laughs> She's a sharpshooter. I'm not kidding. We were on a firing range with James and Betty Robinson. She put a bullet at 115 yards in a bullseye that big. She told me, she said, you commit adultery. I'll make it painless. You'll be on the 10th hole and I'll take you out and you won't feel a thing. <laughs> okay. But let me tell you the real reason. Can I tell you the real reason? Because I don't want to lose the intimacy that I have with her. I don't ever want to cut myself off from intimacy with this amazing woman that I'm married to. That's my number one reason why. Watch this. Emma, these past seven months have been incredible. And I mean, honestly, when I saw you seven months ago, I knew. I knew from that moment that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with you. You're kind, beautiful, smart. I, I can't picture a more perfect woman. So, Emma, 
Billy Thompson. <sighs> Will you marry me? Yes, 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 yes. 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 <laughs> I have to see other guys on the side, but yes. Wait, what? Uh, what are the guys? What, what are you talking about? I'm the perfect woman. Just like you said, I'm going to have gourmet meals for us every single night. Our house is going to be perfect. Oh, it's going to be amazing, babe. And I mean, you're not really expecting me to be a one-man kind of woman anyway. Uh, no, that's actually like a, a, a big part of marriage. Like, you and me, together. Yeah, but I can't give up every guy. I mean, that's asking a little much, don't you think? A, a little... A little... I just asked you to marry me. If we're married, you can't see anyone else. That, that, no, that, that's Nick, just that. wait. You're, okay, I'm, okay I'm shh. It's okay. Listen to me. Listen to me. Look at me. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. You're right. I was wrong. Thank I you. totally understand where you're coming from. This is our moment. And we're going to be so happy together. Every single day. Except once a week. Well, uh, once a week? Okay. What, just no. a fling, once a week. Did you, did you not listen to anything Every other you year? Said? No. On a what? leap year? No. Okay, okay. Emma, I, 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 I can't. I, I can't. Once a week on a leap year, and you're going to freak out? Emma, we're, we're done. What? Babe, you were just asking me to marry you. Are you kidding me? Seriously? Really? <laughs> okay. All right, how many of you guys would marry a girl like that? Let me see your hands. <laughs> Nobody. Why not? I mean, she loves him more than the other guys. I'm going to tell you why he wouldn't marry her and why you wouldn't marry her. Because she hadn't given him her whole heart. She's still got a place for those other lovers. Now, you'd never marry a girl like that. What makes you think Jesus is coming back for a bride that's like that? What makes you think Jesus has come back for a bride? Just give me a little bit of the world. Every other week. If you really believe that, you're as deceived as she is. He's coming back for a bride that has given herself to him the way he has given himself to us. That's why Jesus said, you can't follow me unless you deny yourself. You take up your cross and you give your life to me by following me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. And all the campuses, just bow your heads. Father, I've preached what you've commanded me to preach and I thank you for your help, Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that men would come into a place of intimacy with Jesus tonight like they've never known before. With your head's bowed, your eyes closed. I'm going to say something that might, might ruffle your feathers. You can know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You can know he died on the cross. You can know he was raised from the dead. You can attend church, be part of a small group, and still not have a covenant relationship with God. You say, John, how could you ever say that statement? Let me give you an example. You can have a girl dating a guy. She knows the guy's an excellent quarterback. She knows he plays for Alabama. She knows he's an excellent science student. She knows he's got a scar in his head from a bicycle wreck he had when he was eight years old. She's been to his house. She's met his siblings, spends time with his siblings. But that doesn't give her a covenant relationship with him. It's not until that young man gets down on one knee, opens up a little ring box like Alex just did and said, will you marry me to her? Then at this point, she's got a decision to make. She can ignore his proposal or say no. And then she'll continue life is knowing about him, even going to his house and meeting his siblings, but not having a covenant relationship with him. Or she can say yes. And if she says yes, that means a couple months later, she's going to walk down an aisle of a church with a white dress on in front of a lot of people. And you know what she's communicating by doing that? She's saying goodbye to every man on the planet, except for the, little, the guy that opened the ring box. She's given her entire heart, her entire life to him. 
When Lisa and I got married 34 years ago, this October 2nd, let me tell you something. I made a lot of mistakes the first week. She made a lot of mistakes the first week. We both made mistakes the first year. We both made mistakes the first 33 years. But let me tell you one thing that hasn't happened, and that is this. My heart has always been hers. That has not changed. Some of you men are sitting in here tonight, whether it's here, whether it's in Tuscaloosa, whether it's in Auburn, whether it's at River Chase. And you know, I mean, you can fool the guy sitting next to you, but why in the world would you ever want to fool yourself? But you know, you know, truth, t- truth be told, you have not given your entire heart and life to him. I want to give you that opportunity tonight. I want you to enter into a covenant relationship and become a true man of God. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand up high. You say, John, truth be told, I really haven't given my entire heart and life to Jesus. I want to do it right now. I want you to lift up your hands. Man, look at the hands going up. There must be 250 hands up in the air. I want you to stand up if your hand's raised. No bride's ever been ashamed of her husband. Just stand right there at your seat. Just stand up. Just stand up. I want to make sure nobody's missed. I want to make sure no one's missed. So I want to give you another few minutes. Anybody else? There's probably about 200 to 250 men standing right now, but I don't want anyone missed. I'm editing a book right now, and I have just edited the chapters on hell and heaven, and let me tell you, I have never been so passionate about getting people saved. Is there anyone else? You know, God did a lot to save us, but he will not force us to enter a relationship with him, and neither will I. If God won't do it, I won't. You have to choose. And if you're sitting there and you're saying, well, I'm just waiting for God to hit me over the side of the head. Look, that just may not happen. So I want to give you one more opportunity for you to make the choice to say yes to Jesus. Is there anyone else? Just stand up right now with every head bowed, every eye closed. Yes, sir. I just see, I saw you. Another man stood up. Yes, sir. Another man stood up. You two were worth the wait. Anybody else? I want to make sure no one's missed tonight. Okay. Now I'm going to ask one more question before I pray. If you're sitting in here tonight and you'd say, John, I truly have given my life to Jesus, but I have certainly not been chasing holiness. I've not been chasing after it with the intent to apprehend it. I want the grace of God in my life so I can chase after holiness. I want that intimacy with God. If that's you, you stand up with these men too. Stand up right now. If that's you. I don't know what's happening in the campuses right now, but here we've got about 98% of the men standing up. I love this church. God, you're so honest, so teachable, so well taught. I want you to just lift your hands up right now. Why, why are you having me lift my hands up? It's just an outward sign of what you're doing inside. You're surrendering everything to him. You're saying, Jesus, my entire life is yours. With your hands lifted up, I want to pray with you. I want you to repeat this prayer with me. I'm going to pray for the 250 guys and all the guys in the campuses that stood up first, and then I'm going to pray for the second group. But I want everyone to pray that's standing. Say this out loud. I want your ears hearing you say it. Say this with me. God in heaven, thank you so much for loving me so much that you sent Jesus when I deserve to die. Thank you so much for this. Today, April 15th, 2016, I give my spirit, soul, and body everything I am, everything I have to you, Jesus. Jesus, my life's completely yours. You are my Lord. Not only are you my Lord, but you're my King and you're my lover. Thank you. I'm born again. I belong to God, and no one can ever remove me. I'm yours forever. And now, Father, thank you that not only did you give me your gift of grace to be saved, to be freed from the penalty of sin, but you gave me your grace to empower me to walk free from sin. And you said, Lord, that I am to come boldly to the throne of grace 
And I come there now. And I'm asking you for that empowering grace that gives me the ability to walk free from sin, to pursue holiness, to live in such a way that my behavior reflects my position, that I'm one of your faithful ones. I receive that from you tonight, and I give you praise. Now just lift your hands up one more time. Holy Spirit, you are the Spirit of grace. Now let me pray for you. You just lift your hands up. If you could see the face of Jesus right now, you wouldn't see a disgusted look. Guys, you wouldn't see an angry look. You would see the biggest smile. Some of you are getting a glimpse. You would see the most strong but tender loving eyes and every bit of his gaze is on you, guys. Every single bit of his gaze is on you. There's his presence right there. Wow, it's already happening. Now, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you, touch every man that's standing, whether they're in Auburn, Tuscaloosa, River Chase, or here. There's his presence right there, right there. Wow. Thank you. There's his presence right there. It's getting stronger. Now I want you to whisper to him. And don't, don't say anything religious. I don't care if you say, Dad, you're just amazing. Just speak to the one you're looking at in your heart right now. That's it. There's his presence right there. Right there. Right there. Wow. Now I want you to thank him. Just whisper thank you and mean it. And now let's give him praise. I just want to ask one last question. I don't want you to be polite. I want you to be honest. How many of you honestly sense the presence of God? Wow. Let me just quote James 4. Draw near to God. You draw first. That's what you just did. And then he will draw near to you. James is writing to Christians. And then you know what he says? Cleanse your hands, you sinners. He's writing to Christians. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Because your heart is divided between God and the world. That's what James said in the New Living Translation. You know what you just did? You purified your heart tonight, guys. And you cleansed your hands. And God manifested his presence. And that's going to happen in your car, in your shower. You walk out of here, the devil says, ah, nothing happened. Tell him to shut up. All right? I love you guys.